Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and this is a BD-38. That is a brand new production semi-automatic clone of the German MP-38. Not the MP-40. There are some relevant differences between the MP-38 and the MP-40, and we'll touch on those. And there's also some interesting history as to why someone is making a semi-automatic copy of the 38 and not the far more common and really what is probably going to be more popular MP-40. But before we get into that, I want to give a big thanks to Guns.com for sponsoring this video. These things are stupidly expensive right now, and it was a big help to have them supporting me on this one. Uh, Guns.com may look at a glance like just another sort of drop shipping online gun sales site, but they are actually quite a bit more than that. They not only have their own warehouse where they stock some pretty interesting stuff that's on their website, they also have a really cool setup where they network with brick and mortar FFLs across the country to allow those guys to advertise and sell their guns through Guns.com. So small dealers can essentially get the power of a nationwide uh, website and access to a nationwide clientele without having to all set up and run their own independent websites. So it's a pretty cool thing for uh, customers. It's also really cool for FFLs. I, I know there are a lot of FFLs who watch the channel. If you have a small shop and you don't want to set up your own website, but you do want to sell some stuff online, check out guns.com. They've got a lot of, they've put a lot of thought into how they make that system work, and it's uh, worth looking into. Anyway, back to our BD38. So uh, the D here stands for Dietrich, and that is a guy named Bernd Dietrich, who is a German, who has been making semi-automatic new production copies of World War II German small arms for way more than 10 years, probably 20 years, maybe more than that. I don't know exactly when he started, but he had this fascinating uh, desire to essentially build repros of everything. There are a number of guns that I would say are common enough still that it's maybe not worth making reproductions yet. Like the G43, the Walther Gewehr 43, There's, they're expensive, and they're getting more expensive recently, but uh, for a long time they were cheap enough that there's no way you could make a new one for less than the price of buying a nice original one. Now that's changing a little bit now, but Dietrich's been making a semi-auto uh, Gewehr 43 for a long time in Germany. You may recall, you may have seen, the PTR-44, the semi-auto Sturmgewehr clones that came into the US through PTR about 10 or 12 years ago. Those were guns that were actually made by Dietrich in Germany. Now, I think he has long wanted or long been interested in importing guns into the US. He's sent them elsewhere in Europe. He sent them to Canada. You can find some of them, or you could, until laws changed in Canada. Um, but there have always been problems with the exact technical construction of Dietrich guns that don't make them importable. Basically, to be allowed for import into the US, the gun has to be modified a bit so that original full auto parts can't just drop onto it and turn it into a machine gun. And the manufacturer in Germany has always been a little less strict on that, and Dietrich makes guns that are extremely close to original specifications. They're really good reproductions, which is part of why they're so expensive. Then they're good enough reproductions that it's never really been feasible to get them into the US. I don't know the exact details on how they got the PTR-44s in, but I know that it was difficult enough that it never happened again. And there's clearly a huge demand for those guns, if, they, if there'd been a way to bring them in, I'm sure someone would have. Well, what ultimately happened is Dietrich found a partner here in the US, and they have set up DK Productions, and they're starting to make these guns in the US. And the plan, apparently, is to basically build everything that Dietrich does in Germany over here to US specification. And that includes, well, they started with the MP38, because Dietrich being Dietrich, he makes an MP38 and an MP40, both because there are subtle differences between the two. He also does first and second pattern FG42s. He does three different versions of Sturmgewehr, the MP43, uh, the MP44, and the uh, uh, does the MKB42H. Uh, he does a BD15, which is a, a reproduction version of the Volkssturmgewehr uh, 15, the Volkssturmgewehr Gustloff, which is a really interesting cool gun as well. Like, all sorts of stuff. I don't know if they're going to make G43s here, I still don't think that's probably quite worthwhile, but this is the first gun that they have actually produced, gotten onto the market, and sold. And it is a magnificent copy of the MP38. So let's take a closer look at it. All right, first things first, uh, DK sells this as a pistol. And when you get it, there's just a big old hole in the back of the frame here. They do have stocks, 
literally the day that I got this, I sent off a Form 1 to turn it into a short barrel rifle. Because to me the idea of having this as just a pistol is like worse than not having it at all. Uh, if I'm going to have something like this, I want it to actually have a stock on it. So given that it costs four grand, the extra 200 bucks to put a stock on is not that big a deal. Um, and it makes the gun so much better, more appropriate. Looks better, shoots better, everything's better with the stock. So uh, that's why I have the stock on here. Note that they did not make any dumb concessions to uh, SBR law, or I mean, this kind of came out after pistol braces were no longer a thing, but they didn't put a Picatinny rail on the back of an MP38. They actually gave it the proper stock and then just took the stock off to sell it as a pistol. So I really appreciate that. There's a lot of thought that went into this as a, a, a reproduction, a historically accurate reproduction. Now it is semi-automatic only, it fires from a closed bolt, the originals were of course open bolt firing, and yes, another elephant in the room, there are some far cheaper MP40 semi-auto copies out there. Uh, GSG did one, it is, well there's a 22, I'm not even going to count that. GSG did one in 9mm that has gotten some pretty just totally atrocious reviews. Uh, everyone I know who Everyone I've seen who got one has had a lot of problems with them. This, so far for me, actually works really well, which is nice. Unlike the GSG guns, it also actually uses original MP40 mags. So here's an original one that I have. They do make their own magazines. So this is a DK Productions Repro mag. Uh, works just as well as the originals, which I'm pretty impressed by. The manufacturing is, like, they've copied the magazine, pretty much. Uh, don't worry about this, there are a number of variations of MP40 mags, but um, they've done a really nice job. You notice things like the, the magazine disassembly method, the floor plates are the same. I, I'm impressed. Well done. The most distinctive element of the MP38, as opposed to the MP40, is that it was made with an all milled tubular receiver, and they cut all of these little lightning flutes in the receiver to reduce the weight at least a little bit. Um, MP38s are actually really scarce, original ones. They manufactured only about 42,000 of these. Production began in 38. The MP40, which improved a number of these elements, went into production in 1940. Um, MP38 production continued into 1941. It was running in parallel with the MP40 for a short time. Um, but in total only about 42,000 of these, and right at the beginning of the war. So a lot of them didn't survive the war, and there weren't that many to begin with. The next distinctive detail is this hook-shaped charging handle. So the MP40 has a much larger charging handle that's easier to keep a good grip on, it's more stable. Uh, and it doesn't, it's not applicable to the semi-auto guns here, but originally there was no safety on the MP38 except for this cocking handle slot. And so in order to keep the weapon safe, what you would do is pull the bolt all the way back and lock it up into that slot. Now the bolt can't go anywhere, it can't fire, very safe, everything's great. Except what they discovered when they took these into combat is, yeah, it's, it's all safe, except you've got your loaded magazine right there and this gigantic wide open ejection port and dirt gets in there and it causes the gun to not work. So, okay, we need to fix that. Like, safety is one thing, but we're in combat, we need the guns to be reliable. So, screw it, we'll just carry it with the bolt closed. Uh, even it, well, these were open bolt guns, so if you close the bolt there's obviously no round in the chamber, but you'd have a loaded magazine, empty chamber, closed bolt. The problem with that is that there is nothing holding this back on the full autos either. Um, and so if the gun fell, if it got, if, it, if you hit the rear of the gun on something, the bolt could bounce open enough to pick up a cartridge and then slam it forward and fire. This is a classic open bolt submachine gun safety hazard, and there was no solution to it on the original MP38. So what they actually did as sort of a stopgap measure was make a little leather contraption that looped around the barrel and had a, a thong that came back here and a little slot for the charging handle, and you would actually like put this leather strap over the charging handle to hold the bolt forward. There are a few pictures out there you can see in some books of, of that. What they did with the MP40 was they actually cut a notch here and they added a protrusion onto the also larger and easier to use bolt handle so that you could lock the bolt handle into the receiver tube so you could carry it with the bolt closed and not risk it bouncing open and unintentionally firing. 
and a lot of original MP38s that survive today were modified to to have that safety system. The Germans went through and updated existing guns. So finding an original MP38 in its early configuration is really, really scarce, which is part of the reason I think it's really cool to have the really early pattern of a reproduction. This is going to be the hardest style you'll ever have to try and come by if you want to collect German World War II small arms. Now for the semi-automatic guns what they did is actually add a crossbolt safety right here on the trigger guard, and that's relevant because originally there, there was no semi-auto function on an MP38. Uh, it was full auto only, and like we just talked about, the safety was up here. So had they copied it exactly, there would be no safety mechanism whatsoever, uh, and, and that's not really ideal. Certainly it's not something that is going to be feasible from a corporate liability perspective. The markings on here are pretty well recreated. We have MP38, uh, production code AYF, that would be the late production from the Irma factory. Uh, Irma and Hainel were the two companies that made MP38s, and there was only the one order of them. Uh, this one's dated late, 1941, but this is, and uh, you will find authentic examples with this set of markings. And they even went so far as to duplicate the proof marks. So you've got your serial number up here on uh, the frame and the barrel, and they've got a number of fake Waffenamp style proof marks. No swastikas on them, uh, but the look is correct, it's appropriate. That's the, sort, that's the style of markings you would see on an original MP38, and it's really cool that they actually duplicated that. There are some pretty subtle details that they did correctly as well, like the muzzle nut here. This was intended for use with a blank firing adapter, and the MP38s had a solid one like this. MP40s would have a groove in the center. So it's a really subtle little variation that, you know, it'd be really easy to just skip over copying that. And you know, if you're gonna make an MP40 next, just make one muzzle nut and simplify your production logistics. But no, they made made them correct, down to some pretty nuanced little details like that. And partially as a result of making this uh, correctly and really well, it's heavy. This thing is a chunky gun. Uh, it would really suck to shoot it one-handed pistol. You're definitely going to be shooting it two-handed, and once again that's why I think the stock is an essential element if you have one of these, but that's just my opinion. Now a disassembly is going to be just the same as on an actual MP38. You've got this locking lug, we're going to pull it out, rotate it. You can see once you rotate it, it sticks out. This isn't a screw, this is, uh, it's a cross pin, so it's either like this or like this, and we just want it locked open, because then we are going to take the whole action and rotate it like so, until the rear sight hits the, the Bakelite there, and then Pull this right off. This is a really tight gun. Um, I talked to DK and they said, yeah, when they're new they are quite remarkably tight, so be aware of that. You do also want to have this cocked. When you uh, disassemble it, don't dry fire it and then disassemble it. You can damage the internals when you take it apart. Things are a little more complex on the inside than on an original uh, MP38 or MP40, but they sure look similar. So we have a bolt, we have our recoil spring and guide. Now on the original MP38s the firing pin was actually fixed onto the recoil spring guide. Here of course they have redesigned this, rebuilt it to be hammer fired. So that's our hammer right there, and when I pull the trigger that hammer is going to drop like so. We got the disconnector, there we go. So that's the hammer. This guy right here is your semi-auto disconnector. When the bolt cycles back it pushes that down, which resets the system so you can fire a second time. And then you've got this kind of goofy dogleg firing pin so that you can have the bolt, by the way there is a firing pin return spring down there, which is an important nice safety thing to have. But by having this dogleg firing pin you can have the hammer impacting down here out of the way of the bulk of the bolt moving, and also allowing you to still have this. So one of the one of the cool technical elements of the original MP38s was the fully concealed telescoping recoil spring. The spring's inside there, and you basically can't get dirt into it because, well, it's all captive like that. So originally this had, like I said, the firing pin on the front of it, and then you had your bolt 
Notice we've got our appropriate markings right there on the bolt too. Like they really put time and effort into this and I've already shot it a little bit which is why it's kind of grungy inside. We can go a little farther with disassembly here if you want. The barrel nut comes off. Again, pretty darn similar to the original guns. Once it's off a little bit we can unthread this whole thing. There we go. So, so you've got the barrel and barrel nut there. You've got this which originally was a rest for the gun so that under recoil it wouldn't... You'd, you'd hook this through a firing port or over the lip of a vehicle so when you were firing uh, in a vehicle the, the gun wouldn't recoil back in and start bouncing bullets around the inside, which is nice. Uh, we've got just a, a shim for locking the barrel in the correct location. We've got our uh, sling bar there. Nothing that I really need to mess with here, we'll just put this back on. But there's your receiver. And there's the whole thing field stripped down. Uh, I guess the one other thing I should point out here is the stock locks and unlocks in exactly the same way as the original, which means it's a little bit of a pain. It's also quite tight. So you push the button in, you can then rotate the stock to the back. It's got a little tiny bit of play, uh, far less than originals typically do by the time they're 80 plus years old. Uh, and then this is just held in place by friction. So that's the stowed position and you just snap it down like so for uh, use. All right, so I put it back together and now we're out at the range to do a bit of shooting. Trigger pull is squishy, a little short, kind of light. It's not terrible. Um, certainly better than some other semi-auto sort of PCC conversions that I've seen. Accuracy is pretty decent. Um, I mean, MP40 sights are not the world's greatest sights. When I take my time, I'm able to make proper hits on uh, that little mini Mozambique. Um, there is a fair amount of bounce to the thing. As I mentioned before, this is a heavy gun. The stock's very light, so you've got a lot of weight out here. There's not much recoil impulse, so to speak, because it is so heavy. You've got a very long throw uh, travel of the bolt. In fact, I'm pretty sure the bolt's not even bottoming out when you fire. Um, but it does kind of bounce around a little bit, uh, more so than you would get on, you know, a, a modern tactical design like a 9mm AR for example. Now I'm going to finish off. I've only got a couple here, then we're going to give the spinner a try. And you get a click at the end. It does not lock open because, of course, MP40 mags were never designed to lock open because well, they're designed to be in an open bolt gun that locks open every time when you let off the trigger. So. Uh, this time we'll go with one of my original mags. This thing runs smooth, like the bolt feels good. It's a stupidly expensive gun, um, and I probably should have put a wrench on that after I took it down, but it's a stupidly expensive gun, but it is really well made, so you got that going for it. Let's see if I can get the spinner. And by the way, I am holding on to the magazine well here. You do not want to hold on to the mag generally, but the mag well is viable. The other alternative is to hold it here, which is subpar.
Oh. Well, that was a little disappointing. I can make hits, but man, I have to be careful about it. <laughs> and the spinner's already completely stopped. Uh, as you will note, though, zero malfunctions of any kind on an original World War II mag. We had zero malfs on our first mag, which was DK production. Production. I think this is, you know, this is my second time out at the range here. We took it out to do some shooting uh, before the Form 1 cleared to make sure if there were any issues, I could get them taken care of before it was actually a registered SBR. And we put maybe 100 rounds through it at that point. Um, we're getting close to another 100 rounds at this point, and honestly, I think the gun's actually getting a little bit smoother over time, which is nice, because it was pretty nice to begin with. Let's give this one more try. Uh, the key to the stupid spinner is consistency, and I am not being consistent here. Uh, sorry. Um, I've not yet come up with any real problem with this MP38, which is pretty cool. Uh, now, am I a little bit biased? Maybe. Uh, if I'm biased, it's biased because I put my own money into this, as opposed to being biased if I'd been given it for free because I'd be biased in favor of the guy who gave it to me for free. So there's really no... There's no getting out of that potential pickle, but, you know, there has never been a quality MP38 or MP40 semi-auto clone available in the U.S. at all that I'm aware of, anyway. I'm, maybe there are a few one-offs out there, someone converting original parts kits one at a time, but it is very cool to see DK actually manage to get Dietrich guns over here into the U.S. and onto the market. They're limited production for the time being. They're doing short runs as they can uh, as they can produce them, and the prices are high. But if this is something that you want, man, they are really cool, uh, and I do not regret getting this one. So I'm going <laughs> to... All right, so I picked the right time to stop with that mag. We'll do a few more shots here, and... Uh, Call it a day. I do want to give one more big thanks to Guns.com for sponsoring the video. They're part of why I perhaps don't have any regret about picking this up for myself. Uh, if you're looking for either a cool place to shop for that new toy for yourself, or if you're a dealer looking for a new audience to market the cool toys that you have available, check out Guns.com. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.